Chapter 10 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1, Ali Pasha by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 This mixture of arrogance and submission only merited indignation, but it suited Kurshid to dissemble. He replied that, assenting to such propositions being beyond his powers, he would transmit them to Constantinople, and that hostilities might be suspended if Ali wished until the courier could return. Being quite as cunning as Ali himself, Kurshid profited by the truce to carry on intrigues against him. He corrupted one of his chiefs of the garrison, Metzo Abbas by name, who obtained pardon for himself and fifty followers with permission to return to their homes. But this clemency appeared to have seduced also four hundred skipitars who made use of the amnesty and the money with which Ali provided them to raise toxies and the tapigate in the latter's favor. Thus the Saraske scheme turned against himself, and he perceived he had been deceived by Ali's seeming apathy, which certainly did not mean dread of defection. In fact, no man worth anything could have abandoned him, supported as he seemed to be by the almost supernatural courage. Suffering from a violent attack of gout, a malady he had never before experienced, the pasha, at the age of eighty-one, was daily carried to the most exposed place on the ramparts of his castle. There, facing the hostile batteries, he gave audience to whoever wished to see him. On this exposed platform he held his counsels, dispatched orders, and indicated to what points his guns should be directed. Illuminated by the flashes of fire, his figure assumed fantastic and weird shapes. The balls sung in the air, the bullets hailed around him, the noise drew blood from the ears of those with him. Calm and immovable, he gave signals to the soldiers who were still occupying part of the ruins of Yanina, and encouraged them by voice and gesture. Observing the enemy's movements by the help of a telescope, he improvised means of counteracting them. Sometimes he amused himself by greeting curious persons and newcomers after a fashion of his own. Thus the Chancellor of the French Consul at Prevesa, sent as an envoy to Kurshid Pasha, had scarcely entered the lodging assigned to him when he was visited by a bomb which caused him to leave it again with all haste. This greeting was due to Ali's chief engineer, Caretto, who next day sent a whole shower of balls and shells into the midst of a group of Frenchmen, whose curiosity had brought them to Tika, where Kurshid was forming a battery. "'It is time,' said Ali, "'that these contemptible gossip-mongers should find listening at doors may become uncomfortable. I have furnished matter enough for them to talk about. Frangistan, Christendom, shall henceforth hear only of my triumph or my fall, which will leave it considerable trouble to pacify.' Then, after a moment's silence, he ordered the public criers to inform his soldiers of the insurrections in Wallachia and the Morea, which news proclaimed from the ramparts and spreading immediately in the imperial camp caused their much dejection. The Greeks were now everywhere proclaiming their independence, and Kurshid found himself unexpectedly surrounded by enemies. His position threatened to become worse if the siege of Yanina dragged on much longer. He seized the island in the middle of the lake and threw up redoubts upon it, whence he kept up an incessant fire on the southern front of the castle of Litaritza, and a practicable trench of nearly forty feet having been made, an assault was decided on. The troops marched out boldly and performed prodigies of valor, but at the end of an hour Ali carried on a litter because of his gout having led a sortie. The besiegers were compelled to give way and retire to their entrenchments leaving three hundred dead at the foot of the rampart. "'The Pindian bear is yet alive,' said Ali in a message to Kurshid. "'Thou mayest take thy dead and bury them. I give them up without ransom, and as I shall always do when thou attackest me as a brave man ought.' Then, having entered his fortress amid the acclamations of his soldiers, he remarked on hearing of the general rising of Greece and the archipelago. It is enough. Two men have ruined Turkey. He then remained silent and vouchsafed no explanation of this prophetic sentence. Ali did not on this occasion manifest his usual delight on having gained a success. As soon as he was alone with Basilisa, he informed her with tears of the death of Kianitsa. A sudden apoplexy had stricken his beloved sister. 
the life of his councils in her palace of Libokovo, where she remained undisturbed until her death. She owed this special favor to her riches and to the intercession of her nephew, Jeladine Pasha of Okrida, who was reserved by fate to perform the funeral obsequies of the guilty race of Tepelen. A few months afterwards, Ibrahim Pasha of Berat died of poison, being the last victim whom Kianitza had demanded from her brother. Ali's position was becoming daily more difficult when the time of Ramadan arrived, during which the Turks relaxed hostilities and a species of truce ensued. Ali himself appeared to respect the old popular customs and allowed his Mohammedan soldiers to visit the enemy's outposts and confer on the subject of various religious ceremonies. Discipline was relaxed in Kurshid's camp, and Ali profited thereby to ascertain the smallest details of all that passed. He learned from his spies that the general's staff, counting on the truce of God, a tacit suspension of all hostilities during the feast of Bahram, the Mohammedan Easter, intended to repair to the chief mosque in the quarter of Lucha. This building, spared by the bombs, had until now been respected by both sides. Ali, according to reports spread by himself, was supposed to be ill, weakened by fasting and terrified into a renewal of devotion, and not likely to give trouble on so sacred a day. Nevertheless, he ordered Caretto to turn thirty guns against the mosque, cannon, mortars, and howitzers, intending, he said, to solemnize Bahram by discharges of artillery. As soon as he was sure that the whole of the staff had entered the mosque, he gave the signal. Instantly, from the assembled thirty pieces, there issued a storm of shells, grenades, and cannonballs. With a terrific noise, the mosque crumbled together, amid the cries of pain and rage of the crowd inside crushed in the ruins. At the end of a quarter of an hour, the wind dispersed the smoke and disclosed a burning crater, with the large cypresses which surrounded the building blazing, as if they had been torches lighted for the funeral ceremonies of sixty captains and two hundred soldiers. "'Ali Pasha is yet alive!' cried the old Homeric hero of Yanina, leaping with joy, and his words, passing from mouth to mouth, spread yet more terror among Kershid's soldiers, already overwhelmed by the horrible spectacle passing before their eyes. Almost on the same day, Ali from the height of his keep beheld the standard of the cross waving in the distance. The rebellious Greeks were bent on attacking Kershid. The insurrection promoted by the vizier of Yanina had passed far beyond the point he intended, and the rising had become a revolution. The delight which Ali first evinced cooled rapidly before this consideration, and was extinguished in grief when he found that a conflagration, caused by the besiegers' fire, had consumed part of his store in the castle by the lake. Kershid, thinking that this event must have shaken the old lion's resolution, recommenced negotiations, choosing the Kaya of Mustai Pasha as an envoy, who gave Ali a remarkable warning. Reflect, said he, that these rebels bear the sign of the cross on their standards. You are now only an instrument in their hands. Beware, lest you become the victim of their policy. Ali understood the danger, and had the sultan been better advised, he would have pardoned Ali on condition of again bringing Helos under his iron yoke. It is possible that the Greeks might not have prevailed against an enemy so formidable and a brain so fertile in intrigue. But so simple an idea was far beyond the united intellect of the divan, which never rose above idle display. As soon as these negotiations had commenced, Kurshid filled the roads with his couriers, sending often two in a day to Constantinople, from whence as many were sent to him. The state of things lasted more than three weeks, when it became known that Ali, who had made good use of his time in replacing the stores lost in the conflagration, buying actually from the Kaya himself a part of the provisions brought by him for the imperial camp, refused to accept the Ottoman ultimatum. Troubles which broke out at the moment of the rupture of the negotiations proved that he foresaw the probable result. Kershid was recompensed for the deception by which he had been duped by the reduction of the fortress of Litaritza. The Gigi Skipitars, who composed the garrison, badly paid, wearied out by the long siege, and won by the Seraskier's bribes, took advantage of the fact that the time of their engagement with Ali had elapsed some months previously, and delivering up the fortresses they defended, passed over to the enemy. Henceforth, 
Ali's force consisted of only six hundred men. It was to be feared that this handful of men might also become a prey to discouragement and might surrender their chief to an enemy who had received all fugitives with kindness. The Greek insurgents dreaded such an event, which would have turned all Kurshid's army hitherto detained before the castle of Yanina loose upon themselves. Therefore they hastened to send to their former enemy, now their ally, assistance which he declined to accept. Ali saw himself surrounded by enemies thirsting for his wealth, and his avarice increasing with the danger he had for some months past refused to pay his defenders. He contented himself with informing his captains of the insurgents' offer, and telling them that he was confident that bravery such as theirs required no reinforcement, and when some of them besought him to at least receive two or three hundred palacars into the castle, no, said he. Old serpents always remain old serpents. I distrust the Suliots and their friendship. Ignorant of Ali's decision, the Greeks of the Seliad were advancing, as well as the Toxidae, towards Yanina, when they received the following letter from Ali Pasha. My well-beloved children, I have just learned that you are preparing to dispatch a party of your palakars against our common enemy, Kurshid. I desire to inform you that this my fortress is impregnable, and that I can hold out against him for several years. The only service I require of your courage is that you should reduce Arta and take alive Ismael Pasho Bey, my former servant, the mortal enemy of my family, and the author of the evils and frightful calamities which have so long oppressed our unhappy country, which he has laid waste before our eyes. Use your best efforts to accomplish this. It will strike at the root of the evil, and my treasures shall reward your palacars, whose courage every day gains a higher value in my eyes. Furious at this mystification, the Suliots retired to their mountains, and Kurshid profited by the discontent Ali's conduct had caused to win over the Toxid Skipitars with their commanders Tahir Abbas and Haji Abesiaris, who only made two conditions. One, that Ismail Pasho Bey, their personal enemy, should be disposed. The other, that the life of their old vizier should be respected. The first condition was faithfully adhered to by Kurshid, actuated by private motives different from those which he gave publicly, and Ismail Pasho Bey was solemnly deposed. The tales, emblems of his authority, were removed. He resigned the plumes of office. His soldiers forsook him. His servants followed suit. Fallen to the lowest rank, he was soon thrown into prison, where he only blamed fate for his misfortunes. All the Skipitar Agas hastened to place themselves under Kurshid's standard, and enormous forces now threatened Yanina. All Epirus awaited the denouement with anxiety. Had he been less avaricious, Ali might have enlisted all the adventurers with whom the East was swarming, and made the Sultan tremble in his capital. But the aged Pasha clung passionately to his treasures. He feared also, perhaps not unreasonably, that those by whose aid he might triumph would some day become his master. He long deceived himself with the idea that the English, who had sold Parga to him, would never allow a Turkish fleet to enter the Ionian Sea. Mistaken on this point, his foresight was equally at fault with regard to the cowardice of his sons. The defection of his troops was not less fatal, and he only understood the bearing of the Greek insurrection which he himself had provoked, so far as to see that in this struggle he was merely an instrument in procuring the freedom of a country, which he had too cruelly oppressed to be able to hold even an inferior rank in it. His last letter to the Suliots opened the eyes of his followers, but, under the influence of a sort of polite modesty, these were at least anxious to stipulate for the life of their vizier. Kurshid was obliged to produce firmans from the port, declaring that if Ali Tepelan submitted, the royal promise given to his sons should be kept, and that he should with them be transferred to Asia Minor, as also his harem, his servants, and his treasures, and allowed to finish his days in peace. Letters from Ali's sons were shown to the Agas, testifying to the good treatment they had experienced in their exile, and whether the latter believed all this, or whether they merely sought to satisfy their own consciences, they henceforth thought only of inducing their rebellious chief to submit. Finally, eight months' pay, given them in advance, proved decisive, and they frankly embraced the cause of the sultan. 
the garrison of the castle on the lake, whom Ali seemed anxious to offend as much as possible, by refusing their pay, he thinking them so compromised that they would not venture even to accept an amnesty guaranteed by the mufti, began to desert as soon as they knew the Toxidae had arrived at the imperial camp. Every night these skipitars who could cross the moat betook themselves to Kurshid's quarters. One single man yet baffled all the efforts of the besiegers. The chief engineer, Caretto, like another Archimedes, still carried terror into the midst of their camp. Although reduced to their direct misery, Caretto could not forget that he owed his life to the master who now only repaid his services with the most sordid ingratitude. When he had first come to Epirus, Ali, recognizing his ability, became anxious to retain him, but without incurring any expense. He ascertained that the Neapolitan was passionately in love with a Mohammedan girl named Nakibi, who returned his affection. Acting under Ali's orders, Tahir Abbas accused the woman before the Qadi of sacrilegious intercourse with an infidel. She could only escape death by the apostasy of her lover. If he refused to deny his god, he shared her fate, and both would perish at the stake. Caretto refused to renounce his religion, but only Nakibi suffered death. Caretto was withdrawn from execution, and Ali kept him concealed in a place of safety whence he produced him in the time of need. No one had served him with greater zeal. It is even possible that a man of this type would have died at his post had his cup not been filled with mortification and insult. Eluding the vigilance of Athanasius Vaya, whose charge it was to keep guard over him, Caretto let himself down by a cord fastened to the end of a cannon. He fell at the foot of the rampart and thence dragged himself with a broken arm to the opposite camp. He had become nearly blind through the explosion of a cartridge which had burnt his face. He was received as well as a Christian from whom there was now nothing to fear could expect. He received the bread of charity, and as a refugee is only valued in proportion to the use which can be made of him, he was despised and forgotten. The desertion of Caretto was soon followed by a defection which annihilated Ali's last hopes. The garrison which had given him so many proofs of devotion, discouraged by his avarice, suffering from a disastrous epidemic and no longer equal to the necessary labor in defense of the place, opened all the gates simultaneously to the enemy. But the besiegers, fearing a trap, advanced very slowly, so that Ali, who had long prepared against very sort of surprise, had time to gain a place which he called his refuge. It was a sort of fortified enclosure of solid masonry, bristling with cannon, which surrounded the private apartments of his seraglio called the Women's Tower. He had taken care to demolish everything which could be set on fire, reserving only a mosque and the tomb of his wife Emina, whose phantom, after announcing an eternal repose, had ceased to haunt him. Beneath was an immense natural cave in which he had stored ammunition, precious articles, provisions, and the treasures which had not been sunk in the lake. In this cave an apartment had been made for Basilissa and his harem, also a shelter in which he retired to sleep when exhausted with fatigue. This place was his last resort, a kind of mausoleum, and he did not seem distressed at beholding the castle in the hands of his enemies. He calmly allowed them to occupy the entrance, deliver their hostages, overrun the ramparts, count the cannon which were on the platforms, crumbling from the hostile shells, but when they came within hearing he demanded by one of his servants that Kurshid should send him an envoy of distinction. Meanwhile he forbade anyone to pass beyond a certain place which he pointed out. Kurshid, imagining that, being in the last extremity he would capitulate, sent out to hear Abbas and Hagi Bessiaris. Ali listened without reproaching them for their treachery, but simply observed that he wished to meet some of the chief officers. The Seraskier then deputed his keeper of the wardrobe, accompanied by his keeper of the seals and other persons of quality. Ali received them with all ceremony, and after the usual compliments had been exchanged, invited them to descend with him into the cavern. There he showed them more than two thousand barrels of powder, carefully arranged beneath his treasures his remaining provisions, and a number of valuable objects which adorned his slumbering volcano. He showed them also his bedroom, a sort of cell richly furnished, and close to the powder. It could be reached only by means of three doors, the secret of which was known to no one but himself. Alongside of this was the harem, and in the neighboring mosque was quartered his garrison, consisting of fifty men, all ready to bury themselves under the ruins of this fortification, the only spot remaining to him of all Greece 
which had formerly bent beneath his authority. After this exhibition, Ali presented one of his most devoted followers to the envoys. Selim, who watched over the fire, was a youth in appearance as gentle as his heart was intrepid, and his special duty was to be in readiness to blow up the whole place at any moment. The pasha gave him his hand to kiss, inquiring if he were ready to die, to which he only responded by pressing his master's hand fervently to his lips. He never took his eyes off Ali, and the lantern, near which a match was constantly smoking, was entrusted only to him and to Ali, who took turns with him in watching it. Ali drew a pistol from his belt, making as if to turn it towards the powder magazine, and the envoys fell at his feet, uttering involuntary cries of terror. He smiled at their fears and assured them that being wearied of the weight of his weapons, he had only intended to relieve himself of some of them. He then begged them to seat themselves and added that he should like even a more terrible funeral than that which they had just ascribed to him. "'I do not wish to drag down with me,' he exclaimed. "'Those who have come to visit me as friends, it is Kurshid, whom I have long regarded as my brother, his chiefs, those who have betrayed me, his whole army, in short, whom I desire to follow me to the tomb, a sacrifice which will be worthy of my renown.' and of the brilliant end to which I aspire. The envoys gazed at him with stupefaction, which did not diminish when Ali further informed them that they were not only sitting over the arch of a casemate filled with two hundred thousand pounds of powder, but that the whole castle which they had so rashly occupied was undermined. The rest you have seen, he said, but of this you could not be aware. My riches are the sole cause of the war which has been made against me, and in one moment I can destroy them. Life is nothing to me. I might have ended it among the Greeks, but could I, a powerless old man, resolve to live on terms of equality among those who absolute master I have been? Thus, whichever way I look, my career is ended. However, I am attached to those who still surround me. So, hear my last resolve. Let a pardon, sealed by the sultan's hands, be given to me, and I will submit. I will go to Constantinople, to Asia Minor, or wherever I am sent. The things I should see here would no longer be fitting for me to behold. To this the Kirshid's envoys made answer that without doubt these terms would be conceded, Ali then touched his breast and forehead, and drawing forth his watch, presented it to the keeper of the wardrobe. "'I mean what I say, my friend,' he observed. "'My word will be kept, if within an hour thy soldiers are not withdrawn from this castle, which has been treacherously yielded to them. I will blow it up. Return to the Seraskier. Warn him that if he allows one minute more to elapse than the time specified, his army, his garrison—' I myself and my family will all perish together. Two hundred thousand pounds of powder can destroy all that surrounds us. Take this watch. I give it thee, and forget not that I am a man of my word. Then dismissing the messengers, he saluted them graciously, observing that he did not expect an answer until the soldiers should have evacuated the castle. The envoys had barely returned to the camp when Kurshid sent orders to abandon the fortress. As for the reasons for this step could not be concealed, every one, exaggerating the danger, imagined deadly mines ready to be fired everywhere, and the whole army clamored to break up the camp. Thus Ali and his fifty followers cast terror into the hearts of nearly thirty thousand men, crowded together on the slopes of Yanina. Every sound, every whiff of smoke ascending from near the castle, became a subject of alarm for the besiegers, and as the besieged had provisions for a long time, Kurshid saw little chance of successfully ending his enterprise when Ali's demand for pardon occurred to him. Without stating his real plans, he proposed to his council to unite in signing a petition to the Divan for Ali's pardon. This deed, formally executed and bearing more than sixty signatures, was then shown to Ali, who was greatly delighted. He was described in it as vizier, as aulic counsellor, and also as the most distinguished veteran among his highnesses, the sultan's slaves. He sent rich presents to Kurshid and the principal officers, whom he hoped to corrupt, and breathed as though the storm had passed away. 
The following night, however, he heard the voice of Emina calling him several times, and concluded that his end drew nigh. During the two next nights he again thought he heard Emina's voice, and sleep forsook his pillow. His countenance altered, and his endurance appeared to be given way. Leaning on a long malacca cane, he repaired at early dawn to Emina's tomb, on which he offered a sacrifice of two spotted lambs, sent him by Tahir Abbas, whom in return he consented to pardon, and the letters he received appeared to mitigate his trouble. Some days later he saw the keeper of the wardrobe, who encouraged him, saying that before long there would be good news from Constantinople. Ali learned from him the disgrace of Pasho Bey and of Ismael Pliaga, whom he detested equally, and this exercise of authority, which was made to appear as a beginning of satisfaction offered him, completely reassured him, and he made fresh presents to this officer who had succeeded in inspiring him with confidence. Whilst awaiting the arrival of the Firman of Pardon, which Ali was reassured must arrive from Constantinople without fail, the keeper of the wardrobe advised him to seek an interview with Kurshid. It was clear that such a meeting could not take place in the undermined castle, and Ali was therefore invited to repair to the island in the lake. The magnificent pavilion, which he had constructed there in happier days, had been entirely refurnished, and it was proposed that the conference should take place in this kiosk. Ali appeared to hesitate at this proposal, and the keeper of the wardrobe, wishing to anticipate his objections, added that the object of this arrangement was to prove to the army, already aware of it, that there was no longer any quarrel between himself and the commander-in-chief. He added that Kurshid would go to the conference attended only by members of his divan, but that, as it was natural an outlawed man should be on his guard, Ali might, if he liked, send to examine the place, might take with him such guards as he thought necessary, and might even arrange things on the same footing as in his citadel, even to his guardian with the lighted match, as the surest guarantee which could be given him. This proposition was accepted, and when Ali, having crossed over with a score of soldiers, found himself more at large than he did in his casemate, he congratulated himself on having come. He had Basilissa brought over, also his diamonds and several chests of money. Two days passed without his thinking of anything but procuring various necessaries, and he then began to inquire what caused the Seraskier to delay his visit. The latter excused himself on the plea of illness, and offered meanwhile to send anyone Ali might wish to see to visit him. The Pasha immediately mentioned several of his former followers now employed in the imperial army, and as no difficulty was made in allowing them to go, he profited by the permission to interview a large number of his old acquaintances, who united in reassuring him and in giving him great hopes of success. Nevertheless, time passed on, and neither the Rasquier nor the Furman appeared. Ali, at first uneasy, ended by rarely mentioning either the one or the other, and never was deceiver more completely deceived. His security was so great that he loudly congratulated himself on having come to the island. He had begun to form a net of intrigue to cause himself to be intercepted on the road when he should be sent to Constantinople, and he did not despair of soon finding numerous partisans in the imperial army. End of chapter 10. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 11 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1, Ali Pasha by Alexander Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 For a whole week all seemed going well, when on the morning of February 5th, Kurshid sent Hassan Pasha to convey his compliments to Ali, and announced that the Sultan's firman so long desired had at length arrived. Their mutual wishes had been heard, but it was desirable, for the dignity of their sovereign, that Ali, in order to show his gratitude and submission, should order Selim to extinguish the fatal match, and to leave the cave, and that the rest of the garrison should first display the imperial standard, and then evacuate the enclosure. Only on this condition could Kurshid deliver into Ali's hands the sultan's decree of clemency. Ali was alarmed, and his eyes were at length opened. He replied hesitatingly that on leaving the citadel he had charged Selim to obey only his own verbal order, that no written command, even though signed and sealed by himself, would produce any effect, and therefore he desired to repair himself to the castle in order to fulfill what was required. 
Thereupon a long argument ensued, in which Ali's sagacity, skill, and artifice struggled vainly against a decided line of action. Now new protestations were made to deceive him. Oaths were even taken on the Koran that no evil designs, no mental reservations were entertained. At length, yielding to the prayers of those who surrounded him, perhaps concluding that all his skill could no longer fight against destiny, he finally gave way. Drawing a secret token from his bosom, he handed it to Kershid's envoy, saying, "'Go, show this to Selim, and you will convert a dragon into a lamb.' And in fact, at sight of the talisman, Selim prostrated himself, extinguished the match, and fell stabbed to the heart. At the same time the garrison withdrew, the imperial standard displayed its blazonry, and the lake castle was occupied by the troops of the Sarasquier, who rent the air with their acclamations. It was then noon. Ali in the island had lost all illusions. His pulse beat violently, but his countenance did not betray his mental trouble. It was noticed that he appeared at intervals to be lost in profound thought, that he yawned frequently and continually drew his fingers through his beard. He drank coffee and iced water several times, incessantly looked at his watch and taking his field glass surveyed by turns the camp the castles of yanina the pindus range and the peaceful waters of the lake occasionally he glanced at his weapons and then his eyes sparkled with the fire of youth and of courage stationed beside him his guards prepared their cartridges their eyes fixed on the landing place the kiosk which he occupied was connected with a wooden structure raised upon pillars, like the open-air theatres constructed for a public festival, and the women occupied the most remote apartments. Everything seemed sad and silent. The vizier, according to custom, sat facing the doorway, so as to be the first to perceive any who might wish to enter. At five o'clock boats were seen approaching the island, and soon Hassan Pasha, Omar Brionis, Kurshid's sword-bearer Mehemet, the keeper of the wardrobe and several officers of the army, attended by a numerous suite, drew near with gloomy countenances. Seeing them approach, Ali sprang up impetuously, his hand upon the pistols in his belt. "'Stand! What is this you bring me?' he cried to Hassan in a voice of thunder. "'I bring the commands of His Highness the Sultan. Knowest thou not these august characters?' and Hassan exhibited the brilliant gilded frontispiece which decorated the firman. "'I know them and revere them. "'Then bow before thy destiny. "'Make thy ablutions, address thy prayer to Allah and to his prophets, "'for thy head is demanded.' "'Ali did not allow him to finish. "'My head?' he cried with fury. "'Will not be surrendered like the head of a slave.' These rapidly pronounced words were instantly followed by a pistol shot, which wounded Hassan in the thigh. Swift as lightning, a second killed the keeper of the wardrobe, and the guards, firing at the same time, brought down several officers. Terrified, the Osmanlis forsook the pavilion. Ali, perceiving blood flowing from a wound in his chest, roared like a bull with rage. No one dared to face his wrath, but shots were fired at the kiosk from all sides, and four of his guards fell dead beside him. He no longer knew which way to turn. Hearing the noise made by the assailants under the platform, who were firing through the boards on which he stood, a ball wounded him in the side, another from below lodged in his spine. He staggered, clung to a window, then fell on the sofa. "'Hasten!' he cried to one of his officers. "'Run, my friend, and strangle my poor Vasilisa. Let her not fall a prey to these infamous wretches and the door opened all resistance ceased the guards hastened to escape by the windows kurshid's sword-bearer entered followed by the executioners let the justice of allah be accomplished said a cadi at these words the executioners seized ali who was still alive by the beard and dragged him out into the porch where placing his head on one of the steps they separated it from the body with many blows of a jagged cutlass. Thus ended the career of the dreaded Ali Pasha. His head still preserved so terrible and imposing an aspect that those present beheld it with a sort of stupor. 
Kurshid, to whom it was presented on a large dish of silver plate, rose to receive it, bowed three times before it, and respectfully kissed the beard, expressing aloud his wish that he himself might deserve a similar end. To such an extent did the admiration with which Ali's bravery inspire these barbarians efface the memory of his crimes. Kurshid ordered the head to be perfumed with the most costly essences, and dispatched to Constantinople, and he allowed the Skipitars to render the last honors to their former master. Never was seen greater mourning than that of the warlike Epirotes. During the whole night the various Albanian tribes watched by turns around the corpse, improvising the most eloquent funeral songs in its honor. At daybreak the body, washed and prepared according to the Mahometan ritual, was deposited in a coffin draped with a splendid Indian cashmere shawl, on which was placed a magnificent turban, adorned with the plumes Ali had worn in battle. The mane of his charger was cut off, and the animal covered with purple housings, while Ali's shield, his sword, his numerous weapons, and various insignia were borne on the saddles of several led horses. The cortege proceeded toward the castle, accompanied by hearty imprecations uttered by the soldiers against the son of a slave. The epithet bestowed on their sultan by the Turks in seasons of popular excitement. The Seleon Aga, an officer appointed to render the proper salutes, acted as chief mourner, surrounded by weeping mourners, who made the ruins of Yanina echo with their lamentations. The guns were fired at long intervals. The portcullis was raised to admit the procession, and the whole garrison, drawn up to receive it, rendered a military salute. The body, covered with matting, was laid in a grave beside that of Amina. When the grave had been filled in, a priest approached to listen to the supposed conflict between the good and bad angels, who dispute the possession of the soul of the deceased. When he at length announced that Ali Tepelenzadi would repose in peace amid celestial oris, the Skipitars, murmuring like the waves of the sea after a tempest, dispersed to their quarters. Kurshid, profiting by the night spent by the Epirotes in mourning, caused Ali's head to be enclosed in a silver casket and dispatched it secretly to Constantinople. His sword-bearer, Mehemet, who, having presided at the execution, was entrusted with the further duty of presenting it to the sultan, was escorted by three hundred Turkish soldiers. He was warned to be expeditious, and before dawn was well out of reach of the Arnauts, from whom a surprise might have been feared. The Seraskier then ordered the unfortunate Basilissa, whose life had been spared, to be brought before him. She threw herself at his feet, imploring him to spare not her life but her honor, and he consoled her and assured her of the sultan's protection. She burst into tears when she beheld Ali's secretaries, treasurers, and steward loaded with irons. Only sixty thousand purses, about twenty-five million piastres, of Ali's treasure could be found, and already his officers had been tortured in order to compel them to disclose where the rest might be concealed. Fearing a similar fate, Basilissa fell insensible into the arms of her attendants, and she was removed to the farm of Beulia, until the Supreme Port should decide on her fate. The couriers sent in all directions to announce the death of Ali. Having preceded the sword-bearer, Mehemet's triumphal procession, the latter, on arriving at Graveno, found the whole population of that town and the neighboring hamlets assembled to meet him, eager to behold the head of the terrible Ali Pasha. Unable to comprehend how he could possibly have succumbed, they could hardly believe their eyes when the head was withdrawn from its casket and displayed before them. It remained exposed to view in the house of the Mussulman Veli Aga, whilst the escort partook of refreshment and changed horses, and as the public curiosity continued to increase throughout the journey, a fixed charge was at length made for its gratification, and the head of the renowned vizier was degraded into becoming an article of traffic, exhibited at every post-house, until it arrived at Constantinople. The sight of this dreaded relic, exposed on the 23rd of February at the gate of the Seraglio, and the birth of an heir presumptive to the sword of Othman, which news was announced simultaneous with that of the death of Ali, by the firing of the guns of the Seraglio, roused the enthusiasm of the military inhabitants of Constantinople to a state of frenzy, and triumphant shouts greeted the appearance of a document affixed to the head which narrated Ali's crimes, and the circumstances of his death, ending with these words, This is the head of the above-named Ali Pasha, 
a traitor to the faith of Islam. Having sent magnificent presents to Kurshid and a hyperbolical dispatch to his army, Mahmoud II turned his attention to Asia Minor, where Ali's sons would probably have been forgotten in their banishment, had it not been supposed that their riches were great. A sultan does not condescend to mince matters with his slaves when he can despoil them with impunity. His Supreme Highness simply sent them his commands to die. Veli Pasha, a greater coward than a woman slave born in the harem, heard his sentence kneeling. The wretch who had in his palace at Arta danced to the strains of a lively orchestra while innocent victims were being tortured around him, received the due reward of his crimes. He vainly embraced the knees of his executioners, imploring at least the favor of dying in privacy, and he must have endured the full bitterness of death in seeing his son strangled before his eyes. Mehemet the elder, remarkable for his beauty and the gentle Selim whose merits might have procured the pardon of his family, had not fate ordained otherwise. After next beholding the execution of his brother, Salik Pasha, Ali's best-loved son, whom a Georgian slave had borne to him in his old age, Veli, weeping, yielded his guilty head to the executioners. His women were then seized, and the unhappy Zobaide, whose scandalous story had even reached Constantinople, sewn up in a leather sack was flung into the Persac, a river whose waters mingle with those of the Sagaris. Catherine, Veli's other wife, and his daughters by various mothers were dragged to the bazaar and sold ignominiously to Turcoman's shepherds, after which the executioners at once proceeded to make an inventory of the spoils of their victims. But the inheritance of Mukhtar Pasha was not quite such an easy prey. The Kapijibachi, who dared to present him with the bowstring, was instantly laid dead at his feet by a pistol shot. Wretch! cried Mukhtar, roaring like a bull escaped from the butcher. Dost thou think an Arnaurd dies like an eunuch? I also am a Tepelenian. To arms, comrades! They would slay us! As he spoke, he rushed sword in hand upon the Turks, and driving them back, succeeded in barricading himself in his apartments. Presently a troop of Janissaries from Kutea, ordered to be in readiness, advanced hauling up cannon, and a stubborn combat began. Mukhtar's frail defences were soon in splinters. The venerable Metchibono, father of Almas Bey, faithful to the end, was killed by a bullet, and Mukhtar, having slain a host of enemies with his own hand and seen all his friends perish, himself riddled with wounds, set fire to the powder magazine, and died, leaving as inheritance for the sultan only a heap of smoking ruins. An enviable fate, if compared with that of his father and brothers, who died by the hand of the executioner. The heads of Ali's children, sent to Constantinople and exposed at the gate of the seraglio, astonished the gaping multitude. The sultan himself, struck with the beauty of Mehemet and Selim, whose long eyelashes and closed eyelids gave them the appearance of beautiful youths sunk in peaceful slumber, experienced a feeling of emotion. "'I had imagined them,' he said stupidly, "'to be quite as old as their father.' And he expressed sorrow for the fate to which he had condemned them. End of chapter 11 End of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1, Ali Pasha by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives, recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.